There's an unprecedented joint operation underway as we go to air tonight with the Army and police working to set up a ring of checkpoints to stop five million Melburnians from leaving the city. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And as Melburnians began another six weeks of bitter isolation to control the rampant spread of COVID-19, the Prime Minister proclaimed the rest of the country is standing with them. We're all Melburnians now when it comes to the challenges we face. We're all Victorians now. But some of the interstate media must have missed the memo, to judge by these gleeful front pages. Mexicans shut out. Evicted. With Hobart's daily paper even moving Tasmania to the mainland and pushing Victoria out to sea. The new island state. Meanwhile, the blame game was in full swing over Victoria's bungled hotel quarantine and journalists had one question on their lips for the Premier. Some business owners are calling for you to resign. Is that something you're considering? Uh, no, I'm not considering that. Your critics are, are calling for a change of leadership. Will you resign? Uh, no, Carl. I'm about to stay in the course and getting this job done. But Carl wasn't the only critic lining up to whack the Premier. They were all doing it from morning to night. Daniel Andrews was not on top of that quarantine in that hotel. The blame is squarely um, back on his shoulders and, and his team. This is really a catastrophic failure by the Andrews government. On Sky, of course, the Labor Premier can do nothing right. But in his latest Herald Sun column, Sky's Andrew Bolt found another culprit to blame, multiculturalism. Is it coincidence that the three worst virus hotspots in Victoria have been seven public housing commission towers, 145 cases, the Altaqua College, 134, and the Cedar Meat Abattoir, 111? Many of the people in those towers are immigrants, often from Africa. The Altaqua community is Muslim, many immigrants, and Cedar Meats is a labour donating company that employs many immigrants. Bolt claims, bizarrely, that he's not blaming immigrants. But Sky's Peter Credlin, on the other hand, made it quite clear she did, as cases began to ramp up a fortnight ago. At least one of the new virus hotspots, with 14 new infections so far, was triggered by an end of Ramadan feast in Coburg for South Sudanese migrants from Melbourne's northern and southeastern suburbs. And was she right? Well, no, she was not. First, because hardly any South Sudanese live in Coburg. And second, because, as the Society of South Sudanese Professionals soon pointed out in a media statement, over 90% of South Sudanese in Victoria are Christian and as such very unlikely to attend Ramadan festivities. Indeed, less than 1% of South Sudanese claim Islam as their religion and the virus cluster was not South Sudanese at all. Whoops. To her credit, the Sky News host, who was once famously Tony Abbott's chief of staff, agreed to meet community leaders and then went on air to admit she'd got it wrong. I want to correct a factual comment that I made in my editorial on Friday night, it was an error, where I wrongly linked a specific COVID cluster in Melbourne's suburbs with the South Sudanese community. It wasn't accurate, it was incorrect, and given I pride myself on being accurate, I apologise to my viewers for getting that comment wrong, and in particular, I apologise to the South Sudanese community. So how on earth did Credlin make the mistake? Hard to say. But she clearly had strong views on how the virus had spread, which she'd made clear in her editorial, and for which she did not apologise. And her line was, the South Sudanese can't be trusted to do the right thing. According to community leaders, Melbourne South Sudanese weren't really aware of the rules. The same rules, of course, that we've been banging on about for months, not just in the media, but out in the streets, because, this is what they say, Although community health messages were printed in the language of Dinka, many Sudanese migrants can't speak, can speak Dinka, but they can't actually read it. And not only did Credlin brand them illiterate, which in war-torn South Sudan they may well have been, she continued... Now, the reason they can't read it is that many of them, especially the women, were banned from attending school in their former homeland. So, did Credlin get that right? No, again. Or not according to the South Sudanese professionals who responded. This is false. Women and girls are not banned from attending schools in South Sudan. Credlin's original editorial had finished off with an even broader attack on the character of South Sudanese immigrants, which went like this. 
If the culture is about gang membership, unemployment and an inability to speak Australia's national language, the point of not even knowing about social distancing, doesn't that have to change urgently for everyone's good? Krelin did not apologise for that either, which led the South Sudanese professionals to issue a second statement branding her apology inadequate and saying... Ms Credlin's statements unjustifiably and unfairly attacked, demeaned, defamed and vilified the South Sudanese community. People were heartbroken, angry, deeply frustrated and felt racially targeted. The community is now preparing a complaint of racial vilification to the Human Rights Commission. And Top Silk, Ron Merkel QC, who led the successful racial discrimination action against Andrew Bolt, has taken on the case. We'll keep you posted. Meanwhile, Crittenden and Bolt weren't the only ones blaming some immigrants for spreading the plague. Discussing the lockdown of nine Melbourne public housing towers in her regular spot on Today, One Nation Senator Pauline Hanson made the same leap. A lot of these people are from non-English speaking backgrounds, probably English is their second language, who haven't adhered to the rules of um, social distancing. They all use a lot of the same laundries. Yes, no English and no social distancing. And it got worse. The fact is that a lot of them are drug There are 3,000 people, well. Pauline. They've actually met medication. They're getting their medication. They're actually they're alcoholics, so they, they're being looked after that way. Yep, drug addicts and alcoholics. Man, don't feel too sorry for them, she said, because they're used to hardship. If they're from war-torn countries, which some of these people are, they know what it's like to be in tough conditions. It was awful stuff. As today host Alison Langdon asked... Do you have a heart, Pauline? And fellow panellist, Stella Magazine's Sarah Lamarquand also took Hanson on. Pauline, this is an absolute nonsense. It's got nothing to do with whether you speak English or not. Australia is not a war torn uh, country. This is Melbourne. Yeah. It's a city in our country. This is unacceptable that we are standing by and watching citizens being treated this way. But on social media, it was Hanson's message, not Lamarquand's, that Channel 9 chose to amplify, inviting viewers to chime in. What do you think? Has the One Nation leader gone too far? And that spectacularly backfired as Twitter users turned on today. This is shameful. Minorities and people locked down in that building are going through enough without your show platforming a racist to vilify them. Pauline Hanson is a racist. You knew that before you invited her on your show. And it wasn't just the Twitter chattering classes. Media watchdog the ACMA told us it received more than 130 complaints in the days after her rant. So, how did Nine respond? Surprisingly, by cutting her loose. Pauline Hanson will no longer appear as a contributor on the Today Show, following comments made by the One Nation senator on the program this morning. Condemnation then came from today's presenters. I felt completely heartbroken. I grew up in Housing Commission. That was hate speech mm -hmm. that we saw yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we were all shocked, we were all mm. disgraced. Um, I was shocked. But how shocking or surprising was it, really? Hanson's well known for her controversial views, and Breakfast Television has been happy to give them oxygen. Like this time on Sunrise, back in 2010. Would you sell the house to an Asian? Not to a, an Asian who lives in another country, to an Australian who's of Asian background, no problems whatsoever. A Muslim? No. By 2016, Hanson had landed a regular gig on Sunrise, giving her a top-rating platform to mouth off on issues of the day. Climate is changing, but it's not from humans, Sarah, and get this through your wow. head, all right? Some of these journalists, I drowned half of them, actually. Hanson was mostly given an easy ride by the Sunrise hosts until last year, when in the wake of the Christchurch terrorist attack, David Koch pushed back. Most of the terrorist attacks are right-wing white supremacists that I, live sorry, in fear, sorry, that are, that are regged on, that are regged on, that are regged on, that are regged on by your comments, anti-Muslim comments, saying they don't deserve Dave, to be here. Rubbish. Sunrise did not sack Hanson, but Hanson sacked them, declaring a seven boycott while walking across the street to nine. And that's where Hanson's been for the last 18 months as a welcome guest on Today, peddling more offensive rhetoric each week, like this on the decision by Indigenous elders to close Uluru to climbers. It's no different to coming out and saying, we're going to close down Bondi Beach because there are some people there that have drowned. How ridiculous is that? Or this one on the murder of Hannah Clark and her three children at the hands of her former partner. Don't bastardise all men 
out there, all women for that matter, because these things happen. So why do they give her airtime? Simple, as media analyst Steve Allen told The New Daily. Every time they get her on and she makes a controversial statement, regardless of what we think about the tone and the correctness of it, the show that puts her on gets a mile of free publicity. Despite that, she's done nothing for today's ratings, which some days fall below the ABC's news breakfast. So, perhaps, conflict is no longer working. As Rob McKnight, a former breakfast TV producer at 7 and 10, told me to watch... You have to question whether that old style of debating still works in 2020. All breakfast shows are facing diminishing audiences, and the old tricks that once worked can't be relied on to draw an audience these days. But there is one TV home where Hanson is always welcome. On the day she was dumped by nine, Sky News' Andrew Bolt was there to catch her. But now, to political pundits and last weekend's Eden Monero by-election, which was a nail-biting count on the night, with commentators from both sides of politics sitting firmly on the fence. We are now at about 10.15 and it is still too close to call. I think it's too close to call. Um, I really do. Indeed, it was so tight that even the ABC's election guru, Anthony Green, was unable to split them. This is a close election. We haven't got all the votes counted that they would have intended to on the night tonight. But over on Sky News, there was a different narrative because its pundits could sniff a Liberal upset. Let's sh show you the, the map of the House of Representatives with that extra seat. Not a massive change, but, <laughs> but Angus Taylor, I'll tell you what, you'd take it, wouldn't you? No matter how this turns out now, it is an absolutely stunning result. Labor's Richard Miles was trying to hold the horses, insisting Labor was not out of it yet. The fact of the matter is there hasn't been any new information for an hour, so there is no rational basis on which anyone's uh, position would be feeling better or worse. Yeah. But the Sky Pundits just wouldn't listen. At 10.30, Sky News' chief news anchor, Kieran Gilbert, and political editor, Andrew Connell, could see the finish line and were ready to call the winner. Good night for Scott Morrison. It is... Oh, yes. It, it, it just... Another yeah, no electoral what win. Happens, you know, you'd expect him to win from here, but, but, but even outside of that, no matter what happens, is very, very good night for Scott Morrison again. On radio, 2GB listeners heard the same good news. It's 10pm bulletin led with... The Liberals are on the verge of creating history with the party on track to win the Eden Monero by-election. And that was also the message on the front of the Sunday Telegraph the next morning, which boldly declared... ScoMo's Scorcher. Popular PM delivers Labor a brutal by-election lesson. Yes, a brutal lesson for Labor, with telescribes Annika Smithhurst and Linda Sulmalis reporting some coalition figures were declaring a Liberal victory. Well, they may well have been doing so, but there was only one problem. They were wrong. Labor's Christy McBain has claimed victory over the Liberals. I'm very pleased and honoured um, to be the next member for Eden Monero. And the lesson to be learned? Patience is everything in electoral punditry. And if you're going to jump the gun, make sure you get it right. And finally, to another attack on press freedom in our region, with five Australian journalists potentially facing jail. A group of Al Jazeera journalists have been questioned by police in Malaysia over a documentary on migrant workers. The authorities say the 101 East documentary focusing on people being locked up during the pandemic could have broken sedition laws. Seven journalists were questioned by local police on Friday, a week after this Al Jazeera documentary, presented by former ABC reporter Drew Ambrose, went to air across the world. In the name of public health and safety, they've rounded up illegal foreign workers. When you look at these raids, you can't help but think, is this the practical reality of dealing with a pandemic? Or is it racism? Ambrose and his crew suffered sustained online harassment and even death threats after the program aired, and their personal details were published online. They now face possible charges of sedition, defamation and violation of broadcasting law. Al Jazeera Managing Director Giles Trendle told the ABC Today... We are very concerned about uh, the allegations that were made about the documentary and, and their work being impugned in such a way. And we're concerned that they are uh, facing an investigation and that uh, their journalism might be criminalised and that they might be prosecuted. We're very concerned about that. Al Jazeera and Australia's media union have demanded authorities drop their investigation. For now, the journalists are free, but they remain in the dark about their fate. We hope that sense prevails. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website. And don't forget, Media Bytes, every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now, until next week, goodbye.